So uh, welcome all to my talk. Uh, thanks uh, for being here. Um, uh, and my talk is about coffee, but also brewing uh, something on Kickstarter. Um, last year I gave a talk about... Uh, come join us, no worries, no worries. Uh, last year I gave a talk um, uh, here as well. And uh, I love food, so I did uh, food experimentation. And uh, when I talked with Dimitri about it, um, he, uh, he asked me to, to join and uh, to talk about it. Uh, this year I said, hey, hey Dimitri, I did something new. Uh, and I want to talk about this if, uh, if it's possible. Um, so I, I've been working on this coffee project for, uh, well, some time now. And, uh, and I would like to share it with you uh, today. Um, so who of you here uh, drank coffee this morning? Or still is drinking coffee? <laughs> <laughs> I was still drinking coffee. Nice. Yeah, everybody is a, a morning ritual. Everybody enjoys drinking coffee. Um, it's part of our lives. It's been part of our history for such a long time. Um, and I, I, there are people that don't like coffee. Uh, is there somebody in the room that doesn't like coffee or dislikes coffee? No. One person. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it's possible. You know, and uh, and obviously, um, coffee is also being produced or being mixed into other products um, like ice cream or cocktails or whatever. So it's a, a very important uh, factor. Um, so this talk will be about coffee, obviously. But I will also um, be talking about uh, a product I've been working on, um, which is a piece of hardware and software and everything mixed together. And um, I want to show you the process uh, I've been going through. Um, so it's also it's, it's not a technical talk. Uh, it's more of like a fun going through the whole process uh, talk. Um, and if you have any questions, please feel free to just ask or just shout to me. And uh, at the end, obviously, and I, it's a, a a bit of clickbait, um, but we're also going to drink coffee. Uh, I didn't expect so many people here, so it's a, a really small machine and it's probably not going to cope. <laughs> uh, but if you have time, you can wait and then we'll just leave the machine here have enough coffee with me. So, uh, But it, the boiler is pretty small, so it's going to take some time to heat up again. Okay, so uh, who of you here uh, visited my talk last year? So, who saw that? Okay. Um, I'm luckily out of uh, the hot sauce, so I was uh, clearly uh, up uh, to something new because this was, was done and I was super glad to give a presentation about it um, and I probably will be producing more hot sauce uh, in the future, but coffee is my new thing. Um, but before we dive into the coffee, I first want to briefly introduce you to the history of coffee. Um, so uh, in the 9th century um, in Ethiopia there was a, a uh, a shepherd, um, or he had goats, and he was walking around with his goats, um, and at some point his goats were doing some crazy things. They were very energized, they were jumping, and he didn't understand what was happening. And he noticed they ate a few berries, and this is basically a legend. Um, but the, um, the, uh, the goats ate, ate the small little berries, and he was confused, like, okay, is this because of the berries, or what, what happened there? And this was in Ethiopia, and Ethiopia is the birthplace of uh, coffee plants. Um, and he took those berries, he took them uh, to a monk, to a monastery, um, and said, like, this, this, these berries have special power. My goats are happy, they jump around, they're energized, this is like a magical, magical thing. Um, so we need to do something with this. And the monk said, no, no, this is not good. No, this, we don't like magic. We should throw them away in the fire. So legend says the monk threw them in the fire. But at that point, he smelled aromas. He smelled um, the coffee being roasted, basically. Well, burnt, but it's a legend. So I don't know. I wasn't there. Um, but um, uh, he took the, the beans out. and. Uh, well, he got coffee beans, and I'm not sure what happened, but uh, apparently they they produced they put it in water, hot water or something, because they had coffee. They made coffee, and that's, that this is a story about how coffee was created. But the the fact is that it's from Ethiopia. That's the birthplace. Uh, there are many stories and legends about how coffee came to be, or the first one that tried it. Um, it is around the ninth century where it first was discovered. But there are many different stories. Um, what is true is that in the 15th century, um, um, uh, say that, um, 
they travel to uh, Yemen, and that's where the actual coffee um, industry got started because people were very much interested in coffee uh, over there. And uh, the Dutch also started importing it, and actually the Dutch played a big role in the, in the, in the coffee industry as well. They tried to produce it here um, in the, uh, the gardens, actually, the botanics for the Taino, um, and tried to make local coffee as well. Um, so this is a bit of history. Uh, there's way more to it, but I just want to briefly touch it. Um, and there's another part. Um, there are two types, or two variants, two plants, basically. Well, there are lots of variants, but there are two uh, types of coffee beans. It's uh, Arabica, and there's Robusta. And um, they also have a long history. Um, actually, here in the Netherlands, it also plays a big part in our history. Um, because uh, who of you here has drank Bauet Fresh, for instance? I, I, it's, a, it's a large, yeah, everybody. Um, that's Dutch, basically. Uh, because Bauet Fresh is a very established brand here in the Netherlands. And they're famous for their coffee and the commercials. Um, but the fact is, um, they mostly use the Robusta beans. And Robusta beans are, uh, I think, 60% of all beans being produced. And uh, Arabica is 40%. But Arami uh, the difference between Arabica and Robusta is uh, a lot, actually, because um, Arabica only grows on high altitude, above 600 meters, and further up. Um, Robusta doesn't. Robusta, is, you can place it here in your gardens and it will grow. Um, so it's a very, very cheap and, uh, well, not cheap, but it's, it's easier to grow, it's easier to maintain, it's a very easier process, you can do it anywhere, so, uh, so what's up, what's the, what's the difference? So the difference is the taste. Um, Robusta is very much known for, uh, uh, bitter, burnt, uh, burnt tigers even, uh, even, uh, taste, and, uh, isn't really drank pure, some people do but mostly mixed in with Arabica beans. So, for instance, the Dawa Efforts, that you all know, that's a mix of uh, Arabica and Robusta beans. Um, uh, and I'm not saying Robusta is bad, because there's a whole trend happening right now that people are trying out Robusta beans and because they're also interesting. But it, the Arabica, it has very, a lot of variants. Um, it has more uh, uh, sugar and lipids uh, um, uh, contents. And so the, the taste uh, factor is it, just very different from that of uh, Robusta. Uh, so it's a very interesting one. And obviously you have lots of blends and people mix it together. Also the Arabica beans mix them together. Um, but what I'm going to talk about today is mostly single estate, one origin place coffee. Um, and that's like the highest quality coffee. Mostly the Arabica beans because they're limited and people like limited. They're more expensive because people like expensive things. And, the, well, they're interesting in flavors. Um, so I'm going to mostly focus on that. Um, so that's Arabica and Robusta. Um, so another great part in history, obviously, is this, this thing. Uh, everybody knows this, right? Starbucks, exactly. Um, and they made coffee great because at some point in history, coffee wasn't really, uh, uh, um, well, a quality product. Um, like chocolate. Uh, they made it um, that again. They made it great again. Um, and they made coffee very popular. They started with uh, like ceramic uh, uh, cups and like really tried to emphasize on enjoying coffee. And at some point they, uh, at some point they invented coffee to go and that became a thing. Um, and you know, all know where it went from there because now Starbucks isn't that popular anymore. And actually they, they're trying out new things. Um, so another trend is this thing called aged coffee. Have any of you drank aged coffee before? So they have a Christmas blend, for instance, that they do in, in December. Uh, the interesting part is I've been, during this process, I've been talking with lots of people, many people, different people in different industries that do something with coffee. And this is the interesting story. Um, this is an interesting story. Apparently, uh, Starbucks had a lo lots of coffee stored away somewhere. And you can Google it, you'll see where it was. So, um, and they were probably thinking, what are we going to do with all that coffee? So they invented something new. It's called aged coffee. Um, and it's basically raw coffee beans stored away, and then at some point, like two years, three years later, uh, roasted it, and then made it into a new product, which is interesting. And it has interesting flavors. It's an interesting technique. But it, 
Like if you can imagine that there's a beam, it will dry out, the moisture will be gone, it's, and uh, the longer you let it dry, the drier, yeah, the drier it gets. So I'm, I'm doubting about the taste factor, but people find it interesting. Uh, I've also, also seen some other, um, in the last couple of months, I've seen some other trends uh, occurring. Uh, this is also pretty interesting. I've seen um, uh, individuals, uh, no, not professional roasters, but individuals, putting raw coffee beans in, in wine, for instance, or whiskey, uh, uh, sort of green beans, and then like, letting them stay for like two days, getting them out, and then start roasting them. Never tried it, and I've talked with people about this that are in the industry of coffee roasting when they're laughing me. <laughs> left me, uh, left me. So I'm not sure about that, sorry. Um, so maybe at some point I will try it, um, but it is interesting. So there are lots of trends and things happening uh, today, but has been occurring obviously since Starbucks started experimenting a lot. And some, I also want to briefly cover some facts. So coffee is, uh, after oil, the second most traded commodity in the world. So it's, it's, it's huge. Uh, sounds like American. Make it great again, niche. Uh, but <laughs> yeah, but it is, you know. Um, we drink over 400 billion cups per year, and that's a lot. And apparently, like there has been lots of studies, um, drinking coffee is healthy for you. It will not cure diseases, obviously, but it will, will prevent and um, or to reduce the risk. Uh, but eventually, it's a drug, obviously, and we all accept this drug. Uh, caffeine is great. Um, so this was a brief history and uh, overview of the coffee. Um, obviously, I'm, I'm here as well, as well to talk about what I've been doing. So brief flashback. Um, I started talking with um, a former coffee producer. Uh, this, he has a big brand in the Netherlands. Uh, he sold his company and said, like, yeah, hey, listen, I've been doing this since I started doing something with coffee, roasting my coffee at home. Would you like to try it yourself? I said, yeah, sure. Uh, but why the, doesn't anyone do this? And he said, like, yeah, I went to an Oaks Market, uh, which is a local farmer's market, basically, uh, 10 years ago, and tried to sell green beans to people. But nobody understood it. He sell, sold none. And he said, you can get the best quality beans out there because there's no middleman anymore. Because there's like a whole, like chocolate basically, uh, a lot of companies in the middle that earn money and it's too expensive to sell it obviously at the end. So you wouldn't find these beans um, in your coffee place around the corner. You might find it in a more exclusive <coughs> coffee place. Um, so he said, like, yeah, here are some beans, and try it out, and let me know what you think. And I was like, I start, I, I, I roast them in the, in the hackerspace, uh, my local hackerspace, in Rotterdam, Pixel Bar. And I was intrigued how easy it was to do, simple. Uh, I did have, like, uh, instructions, obviously, and I called them as well during the process. But it's very simple, and it doesn't take a lot of time. So I was like, why is nobody doing this? We should do something. We should explain to people that everybody can do this. Um, so we built something around it, and it's called Coffee with Benjamin. Uh, it's basically a kit, and the kit uh, I have here actually, this is the first uh, one. Yeah, <laughs> uh, it's very exciting. I'm very excited about it, um, obviously, and um, I'll, I'll open it up later. But it contains basically a tray which you can put in the oven, and the idea was behind it is that you can, without expensive equipment, you can do this at home because there are a lot of there's a lot of equipment around coffee as well. Uh, uh, there, yeah, popcorn props. You can use different like hacking ways, uh, popcorn poppers, uh, other means to, to roast coffee. Uh, but the point is, you want to um, have coffee beans that are um, consistently roasted. And putting them in the tray uh, is the easiest way to do it, actually. Um, so it's very easy, and we made an app, and it's connected, so you can see the roast and see what ha is happening actually in the oven because in the oven, every oven is different. It has uh, uh, different values as in the temperature uh, of the price. Uh, so you need to, uh, you can track the, and uh, monitor what's happening in your oven basically. And it will give you tips along the way. So, but it's very easy. So it started out by doing this in the oven, doing a paper tray because I wanted to make it easy. Eventually we started designing things and we picked different materials. We went through all kinds of materials, um, which was kind of interesting uh, and very uh, cumbersome because it's not easy to find people around you that uh, are skillful 
doing this. It's, I didn't do it myself, but um, we had some help with this to build this tray. Uh, eventually, we ended up doing some branding on there. Um, and we, uh, a local company helped us out with producing it, uh, which is very, very cool to see. Um, so the tray is actually uh, well together, uh, and it, it looks very nice. Um, so the idea was that obviously the tray is the most important part, uh, and it's a very simple piece of equipment. Um, but we also wanted a piece of hardware. So initially, I started talking. Uh, I didn't want to do it myself because uh, from what I've heard from other people here, but also uh, friends that I know that have done something in hardware, it's very hard to do it commercially. Um, you, it's just not easy. So I wanted to rebrand an existing device. And I contacted, uh, I found something on Alibaba but, which looked nice. And at some point uh, they said, yes, let's do it. And then the next email was, okay, how much? And then we said, okay. And then the next email was, no, maybe not. Yeah, we think it's not gonna work out. So it did work out eventually, and we had to do something ourselves. So we went through this whole process. <laughs> Uh, I'm not going to go with that, like, into the whole, all the details, but um, yeah, we designed basically our oh, sorry, we designed our own um, uh, casing. Uh, we uh, had help with an injection mold, obviously, uh, which is very interesting. Actually, there are lots of talks about this, um, and um, um, it's interesting uh, how this works. And the cost actually of this thing is it's too expensive to do. It's around uh, five thousand euros, uh, so to set up. But eventually, like per piece, it's uh, it's nothing. So the plastic itself is very easy to do. And it, I also thought about doing 3D printing, but doing this thing with it be 3D printing wouldn't really make sense. Um, but uh, yeah, so China, uh, they started producing it. It was a video. It's not a video anymore. Oh yeah, very interesting factory. Uh, I, I love that they shared the video with me. Um, this is <laughs> how it is produced in China. Uh, basically, the plastic that comes out of the mold and then it's ejected, and the person picks it up, puts the pieces out, uh, picks it out, uh, the, the, yeah, the guidance uh, reel, basically, and uh, puts them apart. Um, and you eventually end up with these pieces. And um, I learned a lot of things about injection molds by basically. Um, the top, on the top, you see uh, the, the So it's basically the place where the injection starts, and it's broken off eventually. So you see a little broken off piece. Um, there's like all kinds of ways and techniques to make it clicky. Um, yes, exactly. Um, so I loved working on this, and it was a very interesting, interesting, interesting uh, thing to do. Um, but very complex, and we had a lot of help with it. Um, it was a long process. To put together. Uh, so building something like this took us a lot of time. Um, but it was nice. And this is a very good talk actually if you want to know more about uh, injection mold, uh, uh, which uh, was I think at a Unix conference, um, which is also interesting. Um, but it was a very good talk. Uh, so we moved along, worked on the hardware, and uh, we wanted to do something simple here as well. Um, to not make it too expensive, obviously. Uh, so we use an, uh, an existing Bluetooth uh, uh, module. Uh, this was our first prototype, and we tested it out, and we wanted to know, like, is it actually helping you roasting and producing the roast you want, and giving you the information you want during the process, because uh, it's as simple as putting the beans in a tray and putting them in the oven, but it's actually helping you uh, figure out how to do better roasts. Uh, so we tried that uh, for some time, and uh, it worked out pretty well. Um, so the reason why we also chose the module is because it's certif certified and if you want to put something in Kickstarter, um, you want to do some certification, uh, but we ended up not certifying it. Um, but I will explain some more details about Kickstarter later. Um, and we also uh, used an existing uh, NTC probe, so uh, it's basically a wire, uh, uh, the, uh, a temperature sensor uh, which you can connect to the tray. And 
uh, uh, we use an existing one, and it was ordered on Alibaba as well, uh, super cheap. Uh, and they, uh, we didn't really know what they would send us, like the connect the, the ending part. Uh, they ended up uh, sending us um, these connectors, uh, which wasn't on the design initially on the PCB, and uh, didn't really fit the casing that much. So that was a, a big of a pickle. Um, so we uh, initially thought we would cut it and then solder it together, but um, we uh, uh, ended up uh, ordering a thousand as an initial batch. Uh, because for the plastic you need an initial set so you want to uh, produce and for the PCBs as well to get it like at a price range where it's interesting and um, doing a thousand cuttings and solderings would take a lot of time so we ended up deciding not to do it and um, cutting the um, the connector actually so removing some parts of plastic and making it fit and uh, creating a new connector on the PCB where you can just slide it over and use some uh, uh, hot glue to put it together. Um, and it worked out actually, so uh, if you still need to assemble it, but it's easier than soldering, uh, so pretty glad. Um, so we moved from the tray to the, uh, the casing, to the hardware, um, and then onto the packaging, uh, because packaging is also a thing. <laughs> and that took a lot of time as well. I didn't expect it to be that difficult because packaging, I, I thought like everybody's doing this, this is, it must be easy, uh, shouldn't be difficult to do, but if you want to do something more custom where it fits nicely and because the tray is metal, you want to make sure it's not uh, moving a lot, um, we needed to produce something custom. So um, uh, yeah, basically that. So we designed our own, uh, <laughs> our own box, um, which is basically one, one thing. Uh, you see it here. Basically, one thing cut and once and only print it on one side because that's the way, uh, uh, of most affordable way. Printing on the inside is not affordable at all. Um, and it's easy to assemble as well because eventually you end up with a large stack of only uh, cardboard sheets. Um, so, uh, it's, and the same is for the uh, coffee boxes basically. Uh, which was easy to assemble, a bit harder because they need some more sturdiness. So they have more on the inside, more uh, 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 places where it keeps it together. Um, and we had some iterations for the, for the hardware as well. Uh, so we didn't really know where to put it. Eventually we just cut out one piece on the side where we can just into it. And this was a prototype basically. Uh, so we ended up with this uh, design and this was the final PCB we uh, recently received. Uh, we were very happy with it, very small. And it fits nicely in the casing, luckily, because we thought I was super scared that it would it fit uh, at some point. Yeah, this, also, uh, this is also a pickle, basically, for finding out uh, and moving all those parts like, together. Um, but putting something on Kickstarter, that was the goal. Uh, something related to coffee uh, and finding out whether people would want it. That's, that, this is the reason why we uh, wanted to put it on Kickstarter, because I know people, uh, the uh, the friend I'm working with, Rob, the former co coffee producer, uh, knows a lot of people. Um, but we wanted to sell to people we don't know uh, and let them know what we've been working on. So that's why we decided to go on Kickstarter. And it was also interesting. So we worked on this video uh, that took a lot of time as well. Uh, and that's very important for Kickstarter, obviously. Without a good video, you're not. Yeah, you know where. You need a good video. Um, and we thought we thought, did everything right. We had the product, and I've been been on Kickstarter for, for ages. I've seen many projects fail, and I've seen death threats in reactions if you fail, uh, if you can't deliver. So that's the reason I wanted to have everything ready before we put it on Kickstarter. So we we posted it on Kickstarter, and we got around like almost 70 backers, but we didn't make it. Um, yeah, <laughs> we didn't make it, unfortunately. Uh, but it was not the end. It was our reason to go on Kickstarter is to find people outside of our bubble and see whether we're, there are more people interested in roasting their own coffee, basically. And we got a lot of reactions from people, um, as in not people that backed us, but people that reached out and wanted to know more. Uh, because roasting coffee at home is as 
simple as it sounds, uh, and why would you do this? It's a good question, a valid question, but you can get the best quality beans. You can produce coffee you want, how you like it, um, um, the roast how you like it, and you can play around with it, like you would do with uh, beer brewing or with anything related to cooking. Um, but Kickstarter didn't work out for us also because, um, and I knew this up front, is that you need to bring your own audience. Um, we, before we went on Kickstarter, I reached out to another uh, company that did uh, a Kickstarter project. And um, uh, he was very successful, actually, on Kickstarter. Um, and he said to me, listen, I know your product looks great and the ID is interesting. I'm not sure if people actually want it, but I think some people would like it. Um, yeah, you can try it out, but be aware you need to bring your own audience. You need to start, before you post it on Kickstarter, you already need to do your Instagram, you need to do, like, reach, reach out to people and grow your audience before you post it. And I was like, okay, but I thought Kickstarter was a mean to, to get a new audience, right? Or a way to get a new audience. Yes, that's true, but you only get that once you're, like, successful. Once Kickstarter sees you being successful, you're on the front page or uh, in a, a higher up in the category and people would find you easier. Otherwise, you'll be just down the lead. So you need to bring your own um, um, audience, basically. And I don't know, I'm a bit stubborn, so I felt like, oh uh, yeah, sure, uh, we'll do that, we'll do that. And we had, I talked with a few people, but not a lot. Uh, he talk, uh, he did a lot of work before he posted something on Kickstarter. Um, um, he ended up being successful in the first day. He reached uh, 100,000 euros, I think, in a few hours. Uh, and it was super successful. Um, he actually was so successful, he got like, uh, I think like 100 emails from people saying that they were too late to buy it, so they were angry, because they, you have like a limited uh, amount that you can do for certain things, like the pledges, and people were emailing him. And I was like, well, I thought that was happening as well. It's not happening for me. Um, and still, it's interesting, uh, I, I actually talked, so I, we, I, we did our campaign, he did his campaign, he was super successful, we failed. And I actually talked with him last week or uh, two weeks ago, and he said to me, yeah, listen up, I've been so stressed out. I made some miscalculations. So you have this goal, right? You have set a certain amount of goal, uh, which you want to reach. And uh, our number was also, if, if we like, picked a number, which made sense, it, it, it's pricey. We knew what, 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 what was, uh, was going to happen. Um, but he set a goal, but it wasn't the right goal. It ended up costing him a lot of money to produce it. He made miscalculations, things went wrong, his suppliers ended up not supplying him. So it can also fail in other ways. And to the outside world, he's very successful, but he <laughs> he's not successful actually uh, in that way. He's, he has a nice product, obviously, I love it. Um, but um, yeah, failing is not the, the most difficult part. Continuing and moving forward is a bit most difficult part. Um, so that's why I'm here. Um, and uh, we're now on Indiegogo. Uh, shameless plug. Um, uh, so you can uh, see it happening there. Uh, there's also a video on the background, you don't really see it. So this is the video we've, we've been working on. Um, and uh, we're still on Indiegogo. We don't have a lot of backers, uh, but I want to uh, invite you actually uh, now to uh, try the coffee beans yourself to uh, see if you can taste the difference between Dow efforts and uh, this coffee. Um, and uh, that's actually my talk. This is some credits for the people that helped us out building this product. So thanks for listening. <laughs> and uh, who here likes some coffee? <laughs> okay, it's gonna take some time, so uh, feel free to just step, uh, ask questions if you want. Uh, yeah. So you mentioned that you didn't want to do a certification uh, yep. for your electronics. Mm -hmm. Why would you want to, and why did you decide not to? Uh, we wanted to because all the other Kickstarter projects that were successful in Kickstarter had certifications, so we figured maybe we should do this more of a marketing, from a marketing perspective. Uh, we ended up not doing it because um, I didn't feel a need, uh, per se. I figured, like, okay, well, let's just figure out whether people 
are going to buy this, and if it does become uh, successful, uh, then, or a lot of backers, basically, we would continue, because it's also pricey. Do, do consumers even care? Do they know? Good question, actually. Do you care? No. Well, yeah. No, but eventually, if you wanted to place it in a store, yeah, exactly, um, yeah. and then then you'll need it. And uh, our, we have some. Uh, we thought about that as well. Um, so Kickstarter and Indiegogo for us is a means to reach out to a bigger audience. But eventually, we would like to get it in a local store, uh, and then it becomes important. But it's it's still pricey. It costs you. It will cost you uh, actually because you need to invite a company that will look at your your stuff and then see the cert certification, see how it's built. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Not a fun process. So we'll uh, we'll do that later. Yeah. So I was wondering where would you get like small amounts of unworked beans? Because I can imagine you can buy big bags quite kilos or something. Correct. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, so uh, Rob, the former coffee producer, he has been in the industry for I think over yeah, maybe twenty years. Um, and he's been, he has his own, he had his own brand on coffee, on coffee industry, uh, it's known in the Netherlands. Um, and he, uh, so he, he has some context to uh, get the coffee. And eventually his dream is actually to, to find more local producers for coffee instead of going to, uh, to Antwerp uh, to buy large bulks of, of, of beans from on the market, basically. Uh, that's his dream. Um, and I fully agree, but it's very difficult. Uh, start out with that dream. Um, so he buys <laughs> the big bags, uh, basically. So we have a lot of coffee. So, uh, and, uh, uh, But the idea with this is that we create small uh, uh, boxes of coffee. So I have some here. So basically these. Uh, and they, these contain 300 grams, which is, uh, if you roast, you can roast it at once in your oven. And um, well, I'm not sure how much coffee you drink, but most people would Enough take a month. One box a week. Yeah, well, I would probably, uh, it would cost me a month or even okay. more, so, yeah. So we have three months, basically, in this kit. So it's almost keto. Yeah. Does that answer your question? Yeah. Okay. Any other questions? Feel free to just come up and, oh. Yeah. So the idea would be to uh, first buy the kit, right? Yeah. And then afterwards have some type of subscription or buy the beans, Good buy question. the app. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. So I'm a software developer, actually. Um, so the app part was mostly my uh, my doing, um, and um, uh, I thought about subscription as well because it's very easy to build in the app. Um, and, and Victor as well, actually, he works on the app. Wait one. This is Victor. He's sitting over there. <laughs> Thank you, Victor. Uh, Android sucks, man. It's like, uh, hard to build an Android app. Um, but he helps out with and building the Android app. Very glad that he did. Um, but we thought about subscriptions. Um, the thing is, I, 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 from my perspective, everybody's doing the subscription these days, and you're stuck to the subscription. Will probably, at some point, if it will continue and will be more successful, and people like enjoy their uh, roasting their own coffee, we might have doing subscription. But initially, our goal is to just get people more familiar with roasting beans. So, doing three times uh, is the initial uh, idea. And um, after the Indiegogo, a website will go live, or a website is already live, but the shop will go live, and it will contain more beans from different areas. Because um, the idea is, uh, well, I have three, one here, one is from Tanzania, Ethiopia, so the birthplace, and Kenya. Um, and for instance, the, the one from Tanzania that's very in a very high altitude, it's very different from Kenya. Kenya is very uh, fru fruity, uh, acidy. It's very different from the one uh, from Ethiopia as well. Ethiopia is more the coffee you would probably know uh, as regular coffee which you drink anywhere. Um, and it's also in here. Uh, it's just fun to try out different coffees from different areas. So that's the goal, to get more uh, interesting coffees on the shop. So what, what's the term right now for these types of beans? Is it like green beans, unroasted beans, non-roasted beans? Like what kind of like yeah. Where would you search for it? Because I wouldn't know. Um, so there actually is a Dutch website that sells unroasted coffee beans. Uh, yeah, the green beans, unroasted beans is the same. Yeah, you can look it up. Um, uh, Price-wise, it's difficult uh, to figure out what is good quality and what is a good price. Um, I, I, yeah, because Rob is very.
very familiar in these markets. I think he, uh, he knows his game, so uh, he worked on that part and make it interesting. Uh, obviously, it's uh, uh, yeah, less expensive than roasted beans, which is nice. Uh, but he has to do some work. Yeah. Um, so that. The idea is not to manually adjust your oven. We wouldn't recommend it. Um, normally, uh, if you uh, roast coffee, it's done on high temperature, very a lot, like high, high temperature, for a very short amount of time, and it's very exact, um, so on the second. And if you don't do it on the second, it will burn the coffee. Um, and also, it's cooled down. They have, like industrial coffee uh, roasters, they have a cool down method, they have their cool down method, basically, uh, to make sure it's um, consistent, right? And uh, doing this in your office is never consistent. But the trick is that uh, it's a well, let's call it a slow roast. That makes sense. But it's just a longer, <laughs> a longer process to roast. So you have more time to find that sweet spot where you remove the coffee beans from your oven instead of doing it like the industrial way. Um, and also, uh, we show you a graph uh, of how to like if you look at professional coffee roasters, they have roasting profiles. So they make notes and they see uh, what, ha what happens, what temperatures, the time, and they make notes with it. Basically, this is what the app does for you. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, exactly. Yeah, and the idea in the future would be to extend that even more, to make it easier for you to make more consistent beans. Um, but initially, it's uh, it's very it's, it's simple uh, to make you uh, start doing your own coffee roast. Yeah. What's the best way to grind the beans? Good, good question. <laughs> yeah. So equipment is another story. Also, uh, 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 preparing the coffee is another story. Obviously, um, I'm not a barista. Uh, I'm not an expert on the machines. I know it, it varies a lot. Uh, the grinders are always like the most expensive parts of producing or doing your own coffee. Uh, you have like the, uh, the hand grinders. I wouldn't recommend that for an espresso, but for uh, uh, an, uh, another, uh, like the Temex or just filters, uh, it would work. Um, uh, the thing is with these, the, the grinding stones are the, the most expensive ones in these machines uh, because you, the, you can really finely, gradually uh, change the ways of grinding it, uh, but I'm not an expert. If you ask to go to your coffee shop, to a barista, like a good barista, they, I'm not gonna do it right now, but they will change based on the temperature, they will change it based on the temperature in the room, based on the feel of the, like the bean, what type of bean that is. Yeah, a good barista will do this, because it changes every day. Um, also, moisture gets out of the bean, so like normally, like fresh beans, uh, you can keep them for, for two weeks, max, and then it becomes still, the taste becomes off. It's not like it was initially. Um, so obviously you have only two weeks to, to consume the coffee, but during those two weeks, the beans change themselves in the coffee machine as well, or in the grinder as well. Um, so it's very hard to say. Uh, and there are lots of people saying something about what's the best grinder. If, uh, if you go on Reddit, everybody will show off their, their setup. Um, uh, I would just recommend starting small and cheap, and then move up from there. So. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> Come join me. Thank you. <laughs>